This video is proudly sponsored by Squarespace. If you're watching this channel, and it's safe to say that you are, then there's a high chance that you're interested in building muscle and increasing strength. But do you even know how to build muscle and increase strength? As in, you might know what to do in the gym, but do you know what's actually going on inside your body in a response to training? You might think that you do. A lot of people simplify this down to mechanical tension, metabolic stress, and muscle damage. But it's actually a whole lot more complicated than that. There's a lot more that often doesn't get explained, and there's a whole lot more that we don't even understand. That said, we do know enough to make a more optimal approach to our training, and this is one of those scenarios where knowledge really is power. So without further ado, in this video, I want to explain to you what actually happens inside your muscles and the rest of your body in response to training. And we're gonna go a little bit deeper than your typical explanation. We're gonna look at what we do know, what we don't know, and we're gonna try and apply this in a practical manner and you might be surprised at just what kind of gains you can unlock as a result. It's not an exaggeration to say that this might actually be one of my most important videos to date. So the most common explanation you hear for how hypertrophy and strength gains work is through muscle damage, also sometimes called myofibrillar hypertrophy. Basically, we're told that as we train, as we stretch and place load on the muscle, over time, they get damaged. We create micro tears, and it's the process of healing these that leads to muscle growth. In fact, hold on one second. So inside your muscles, you have lots of muscle fibers. These are made up of something called sarcomeres, and these in turn contain the actin and myosin contractile proteins, and these essentially kind of move across each other via a chemical reaction in order to lengthen and shorten the sarcomeres and then at the upper level beyond that, the muscle fibers and beyond that, your whole muscle. And these lengthen and shorten and over time, this can lead to muscle damage, especially if you place a lot of pressure on it. I like to imagine these as working almost telescopically with the actin and the myosin moving within one another. And if you look at how this works, it's not a perfect analogy, but it's kind of similar. So over time, as these muscle fibers are contracting and extending, they basically start to become a little bit damaged. Imagine an elastic band and it's repeatedly being stretched. Over time, it's gonna to start to fray and we don't want it to snap. That would be a muscle tear, but we just want it to get a little bit frayed. In rush inflammatory cytokines, just as they would do for any injury. And this begins the repair process. This is why taking anti-inflammatory painkillers to combat soreness following a workout, DOMS, is a big no-no and can actually prevent muscle growth. This inflammation is what stimulates the nearby satellite cells to fuse with the muscle fibers and add more myonuclei, triggering further protein synthesis. We don't actually create new muscle fibers through this process, or at least we don't think we do. That's something called muscle hyperplasia, and we're not sure whether or not that can actually occur in humans. There's some evidence to suggest it can, but it's certainly more rare. Instead, what we're doing is increasing the sarcomeres, which increases the thickness of the fibers. But what's really interesting is that the concentric portion of the movement actually increases sarcomeres in parallel. In other words, side by side. Whereas the eccentric portion of the movement, the lengthening phase of the movement, that actually increases sarcomeres in sequence, meaning end to end. Again, there's just so much going on here that we rarely hear about and that we don't fully understand. Nuclei are like the nerve centers of the cells and they contain copies of our DNA, the genetic code necessary to produce proteins and send them to the right places for that specific cell. So think of nuclei like little bubbles containing the blueprints for building the cell itself. They send out the instructions to build proteins that allow you to create more muscle mass. So this is where right away, a lot of explanations only go to the surface level. So it's all good and well to say that you add more DNA and myonuclei and this builds more muscle. But how is it and why is it that more nuclei mean more muscle? And is this the same for everyone? Well, to understand this, we must understand our DNA. So DNA basically encodes the creation of proteins. It tells the body which proteins to make, whether those are the kinds of proteins that are useful for fast twitch muscle fiber or slow twitch muscle fiber. This DNA is identical wherever it's found in the body and it's unique to you. However, what you can do is you can change the expression of that DNA thanks to something called gene transcription or epigenetics. Basically, the DNA remains the same, but some specific parts of it are turned either on or off and this changes how it behaves and therefore allows your body to create more or less of certain proteins. 
In other words, you have this set blueprint, but you're essentially scribbling out and adding to it in order to change the way it behaves. So the best way to think about this is like drawing lots of letters on a board and then crossing out different letters in order to spell different words. The selection of letters is the same in every cell, but which ones you cross out and which ones are active is different depending on the type of cell, cat. And the good news is that this can also change in response to our lifestyles and our training. So when you train hard and your body receives signals to create more muscle, this is due to gene transcription. Everything from our diet to our thoughts can alter gene expression. We may not be able to change our genetic code, but we can massively change the way it impacts on our bodies. So for example, someone with the ACTN3 gene will encode more alpha actinin 3 a protein that's expressed more in fast type 2 muscle fiber. Thus, we tend to see this variant more commonly in power-based athletes and sprinters, for example. However, there's some evidence to suggest that supplementing with Pequi oil can actually result in altered gene expression, thus increasing the transcription for alpha-actinin-3. This is the burgeoning field of nutrigenomics, by the way. Likewise, plyometric training can have a similar impact. Just as an aside then, people who say that you can't train to increase explosiveness, that's very much not the case. You can be more or less genetically predisposed towards explosiveness, but you do have at least some degree of control beyond that. But myofibrillar hypertrophy is just one kind of hypertrophy. The other more common explanation for hypertrophy you might have heard of is sarcoplasmic hypertrophy. And this can be likened to muscle swelling. So if you think of your muscle cell, which in this case is gonna be represented by a balloon, it's full of all kinds of stuff. Let's see how easily I can get this over here. Glycogen sarcoplasmic reticulum, which is a kind of storage unit for calcium, triglycerides, T-tubules, mitochondria, of course, and of course, the fluid sarcoplasm. All these things can increase, and as they do, they cause the muscle to swell. And mitochondria, played by jelly beans, also standing for T-tubules. Ah, goodness. Pop that in there, it feels sort of erotic. Need more sarcoplasm. And then you have a bigger muscle through a separate mechanism than muscle damage. This tends to be the result of higher rep range training, bodybuilding style training. Some people say it's like fake muscle, that the muscles are swollen, they're not actually stronger. This is inaccurate. Not only is there no such thing as a fake muscle, unless you're gonna be using something like synthol. But at the same time, this actually increases muscle endurance to a large extent because you're supplying your muscle with more things it needs to carry on going. And that's very important for your strength and your performance across the board. These higher rep ranges and continuous time of tension flood the muscles with metabolic products. And this has other effects too. We all know, for example, that hormones play a role in muscle mass. Anabolic hormones such as testosterone, growth hormone, etc encourage protein synthesis through channels such as the mTOR pathway. This is released in response to the heightened presence of energy, nutrients, and protein that leads to increases in IGF-1 and other hormones that produce testosterone. In other words, the body builds muscle when it's well-fed. And this interacts with our training. If you train and you're well-fed, you're gonna have a different result than if you train and you're not. Longer bodybuilding style sets can accelerate this effect. That's because a longer set encourages the buildup of waste products such as lactic acid via glycolysis. Lactate can be used as an additional fuel. It also draws water into the muscles to increase muscle swelling, which may act as another stimulus for growth and protein synthesis. And best of all, it stimulates the production of testosterone via the Leydig cells. Lactate also appears to be necessary for growth hormone production. Differences in diet, hormone production, and even the presence of androgen receptors can all impact how profound the effect will be for a given individual. This, as far as we know, is why metabolic stress leads to muscle growth, but there's another aspect to consider as well, and that's blood supply. So over time, this demand on the muscle can even increase blood flow. Through a process called angiogenesis, we actually increase the number of blood vessels supplying the muscle. This allows more of those metabolites to enter the muscle where they're needed, and likewise to shuttle away waste products. Improved blood supply is another great benefit of high volume training then, but the benefits go far deeper still. For example, blood supply is crucial for another type of hypertrophy that gets a lot less attention. That's connective tissue hypertrophy. 
So in short, tendons, ligaments, and even the fascia that surrounds the muscle can also increase in strength. Again, this is something that just gets overlooked when talking about growing muscle. Growing the tendons, growing the connective tissue is just as important. But tendons have a lower blood supply as compared to muscle, something I talked about in a very recent video. They're slower to respond to training. Whereas muscle growth can occur after just eight days of lifting for a noob, they can take around two months for the same to occur in the tendon. On the plus side, atrophy takes longer in connective tissue as well. Connective tissue hypertrophy also refers to fascia, and fascia is this kind of cling film wrap that surrounds the muscle as well as the organs and things. And this not only helps to hold things in place, it even has its own motor units and proprioceptors, meaning it can contribute to not only your sense of self in space, but even force production. And just like muscle, fascia can actually strengthen in response to tension and training. In response to these pressure signals, fibroblast cells actually lay down new collagen and collagenase, actually making that part of the fascia stronger and thereby able to better transmit force. But you see, the fascia doesn't just surround the outside of the muscle tissue. It also actually enters and protrudes into the muscles. It then segments the muscles into bundles of muscle fibers called fascicles. And each of these is then wrapped in a separate sheet of fascia called the epimyceum. This whole video is really just an excuse for me to eat stuff. So yeah, it's kind of like an orange in case you didn't get the metaphor, separated into different segments by a kind of cling film wrap. The interesting thing is that muscle is actually made up of 20% connective tissue. So the fact that we can train and thicken and strengthen the connective tissue means that this is an important avenue for improving our strength and growing muscles. And it may actually connect disparate muscles and help us to strengthen specific coordinations of muscle exertion. But to understand the importance of fascia in aiding with communication and synchronicity between muscles, to understand tensegrity, we could once again use these elastic bands. I'm getting my money's worth. So here, of course, the elastic band represents the fascia. And if you think of it pulled taut, then if you ping on one end, take a look here. If we ping on one end, then that signal travels all the way down the elastic band to whatever it's hooked on at the end there. If, however, the elastic band is loose, like so, and we just move it, well then, here you're gonna be able to sense that something's going on, but you're not gonna be able to feel, you know, the precise rhythm, exactly the full signal. Then there's more. Increased blood supply to the muscle may also increase myonuclei and satellite cells. Studies show a correlation between capillarization and muscle satellite cell proliferation. Supplementing with creatine also seems to increase satellite cells, as does increasing testosterone and training for longer sessions. But we're missing the third major mechanism for muscle growth, that being mechanical tension. And this one's simple. Loading a ton of weight onto the muscles will trigger muscle growth. But again, the question here is why does mechanical tension lead to muscle growth? What's actually going on here? Well, it turns out it's to do with mechanoreceptors. Mechanoreceptors are sensors in your body that provide you with proprioceptive feedback. They tell you things like how hard you're contracting the muscle or how much stress it's under. So I'm able to weigh this protein bar with my arm because I've got mechanoreceptors built in. That weight's great enough, it actually triggers protein synthesis all on its own, even in the absence of other signals, such as hormone changes or muscle damage. And what does this process actually look like? Well, there are actually lots of different mechanoreceptors and there are likely some that we haven't even yet discovered. One candidate, for example, is the lipid bilayer. This is made from lipid molecules located within the cell membrane. It's thought that when the cell is under pressure, this could cause them to get ruptured, thereby triggering a cascade of events that lead to protein synthesis. As though all this wasn't already complicated enough, there's also the different types of muscle fiber to consider. We've already seen them briefly in this discussion. You have your type 1, type 2A, and type 2X. Although in truth, it's more like a spectrum. Slow type 1 muscle fiber contains more mitochondria for energy efficient movement. Type 2 or fast twitch fiber, conversely, contains more ATPase, which is an enzyme that catalyzes ATP from ADP. Type 2 muscle fiber actually appears thicker, but it's also key to note that fast twitch fibers produce more lactate versus slow twitch. And we haven't even considered the role of the brain yet. As I've said many times on this channel, you can have the biggest muscles in the world and you won't necessarily be very strong. That's because you also need to be able to send the relevant signals that tell the muscle to contract. This is why someone physically smaller than you 
may have a far more impressive power clean. They've rehearsed the movement. Muscle fibres are bundled into groups called motor units. Each motor unit is innervated or triggered by a different nerve, which is connected to the motor cortex. The brain area serves as a map of the body, and activity in each neuron here can trigger the activation of a specific motor unit. The bicep, for example, contains roughly 774 motor units, corresponding to 774 motor units in the motor cortex. No one can activate all the motor units in a given muscle at once, so there's a lot of strength that you leave on the table. In accordance with Henneman's size principle, we always recruit the smallest motor units first, which also will be comprised of slow twitch fibre. I'll refer you back to my recent demonstration of this with the ball bearings. If you have ball bearings of different sizes and you blow lightly, you can move only the small ball bearings. But to move the big ones, you'll need to blow stronger. That will move the small ones and the big ones. This is how you can get stronger on a given lift without necessarily adding any muscle at all. Felt like a complete knob filming some of this and it's raining and I didn't want to be a litter bug so at one point I was carrying around wet spat out ibuprofen right now I've got wet jelly beans in my camera bag but I was just trying to find interesting ways to convey what would otherwise be quite a dry topic so I hope this has helped to make it a little bit wetter for you. The main takeaway from all this is that building muscle and gaining strength are not simple. They're in fact highly complex with many different aspects all playing together off of one another. You can't boil this down to a few simple things. Different things are going to work better or worse for different people depending on genetics and other factors. What's more is that there's just so much we don't even know about yet. So much yet to be discovered. There are probably chemicals and processes. Some of this stuff we're only just learning now. Andrew Tracy, who I follow on Instagram, described this process as being more akin to alchemy than science. It's not a precise art. It's more like a dark magic. And therefore we have to just follow what we feel is working for us. But to me, I think an obvious takeaway from this is that we should be combining different training methods, as I always say. If we know that eccentric training builds sarcomeres in sequence and concentric builds sarcomeres in parallel, then of course it makes sense to place emphasis on both to maximize your potential. If you're just interested in building max strength as a powerlifter, it still makes sense for you to use pump training if we know that fast twitch muscle fiber is bigger and potentially more powerful than slow twitch, but we also know that plyometric training, which increases fast twitch muscle fiber, won't necessarily increase muscle strength or size, then does it make sense to spend some time increasing your ratio of fast twitch fiber and then follow that up with training that will make the most of that fast twitch fiber? And I think we can start to even see a glimmer of an optimal order here, potentially, which is something I'm going to be exploring a lot more in future, and it's something I've actually been doing in my programs for the longest time now. If you want a training program that does combine lots of different training styles in order to maximize your results, then you might be interested in my ebook and training program, Super Functional Training 2.0. That includes high rep work, it includes mobility work, it includes heavy weights and skills practice. So yeah, you should get compounding results from that. It's an 80 plus page ebook with over two hours of instructional video, and I'll leave a link to that in the description down below. Either way, guys, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye for now. So building muscle is complicated, but you know what's not complicated? Building a website, at least not when you use Squarespace. Squarespace is today's sponsor and it's a powerful online platform for developing modern, attractive and professional websites with no code necessary. So this way you can turn your passion into a business. And with Squarespace you can build any kind of website you need. There is no limit to the number of tools available. You have gated members-only content for easy revenue generation, member management, inbuilt email communications, audience insights, all in a single, easy-to-use platform. There's a fully integrated commenting system with threaded comments, replies, and likes. Powerful blogging tools for sharing content, categorizing posts, scheduling, publishing, and more. And social media integration to display posts from your social profiles directly on your website or to push social media content automatically. There's a comprehensive suite of e-commerce capabilities, and you can expand on any of these things by adding third-party extensions, leveling the playing field in this way by giving everyone the tools they need to create professional and beautiful looking websites is a cause that I truly believe in. That's why I'm really proud to have Squarespace as a sponsor. And when you're ready to launch, Binary viewers can get 10% off the purchase of their first website or domain by going to squarespace.com forward slash the Bioneer today. Thanks once again to Squarespace for supporting this channel and thanks to you guys for watching through to the end. Bye for now.